We've now talked about the short run, where our main concern was around business cycles, or short run fluctuations around the natural level of GDP. Then we talked about the intermediate run, where our main concern was to explain the composition of GDP into consumption, investment, government purchases and net exports over a 5 to 10 year period. Now we're going to turn to the long run, and the main concern in the long run is economic growth. Now to answer questions about economic growth, we first have to build a new model. In this model, GDP, and by GDP here we mean the natural level of GDP, is a function of a number of variables. The first one we're going to call L, where L simply stands for labor hours. How many hours of labor are there actually available in this economy? Next we're going to add N, where N stands for natural resources. The land, the water, the air. And what's underneath the land? Minerals, oil, gas, gold, and so forth. Then we're going to add K, where K stands for physical capital factories, office buildings, equipment, but also public infrastructure like roads and electricity network and internet access. So by physical capital, we mean both the physical capital that's provided by the private sector as well as what's provided publicly. Finally, we're going to add a term T, where T stands for technology. but we're going to put quotation marks around technology because we don't just mean the current state of technology and the current state of knowledge. We also mean how well people can use that technology. What kind of skills do they have to use the technology? And so we're going to say that that's including what we've been calling human skills or human capital. Now we have this function, and if we wanted to graph that function, we would have to do so in five dimensions. We'd need a dimension for y, one for l, one for n, one for k, and one for t. And of course, we can't graph in five dimensions. So to make progress, we're going to have to hold some things fixed. So we're going to hold labor fixed and assume that the population is constant. Then we're going to hold natural resources fixed and assume that those just are what they are. And finally, we're going to hold technology fixed and assume that it is what it is, including the human capital. Now we have a function that's just a function of one variable, just physical capital. We can graph that function. So we can put capital on one axis and y, GDP, on the other axis. Now we're going to end up measuring a number of things on the vertical axis, and they're all going to be denominated in dollars. But one of those is the natural level of GDP. So what's the relationship between the level of capital and the natural level of GDP if we hold labor, natural resources, and technology fixed? Well, this takes us back to the beginning of the course, where we talked about the law of diminishing marginal product. The law of diminishing marginal product says that if we add additional increments of an input, like capital, and we hold everything else fixed, then those additional increments of capital will yield less and less additional output. So initially, as we start putting capital into this economy, we're going to get a big increase in GDP. But as we add more and more capital, the additional increments to GDP are going to get smaller and smaller. So we're going to get this kind of shape because of the law of diminishing marginal product. So that's going to represent the level of GDP as capital in the economy changes when we hold labor, natural resources, and technology fixed. Next, we're going to think about investment. And we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that investment as a share of GDP is constant. Suppose it's like 20%. Well, that means 
that as GDP goes up, investment goes up. But investment is always 20% of GDP. So to draw the investment relationship, we simply have to take this original relationship for GDP and take 20% of it at every point. So we're going to get the same shape. It's just going to lie lower in the graph. So we're going to get some relationship for investment that looks like this. Finally, we're going to think about one more line. Capital has the feature that it depreciates over time. It deteriorates over time as we use it. That's true for factories, for equipment, for office space, for roads, for electricity networks, for all forms of physical capital. So we're going to assume that physical capital depreciates at a constant rate and all types of physical capital depreciate at that same rate. Well, that means that just to keep capital at its current level, we have to engage in a certain amount of investment to replenish that capital that's been depreciating. So as capital increases, we have to spend more and more just to keep that level of capital constant. If capital depreciates at a constant rate, we're going to get a linear relationship for the amount of capital that's necessary just to keep the capital stock constant. So we're going to get some relationship like this. Perhaps we have to spend 5% of whatever capital we have every year just to keep that capital going. We're going to call that our uh, depreciation investment line. So again, all that line tells us is that if we have this level of capital, we have to spend this much just to keep that level of capital going. Of course, if we don't have any capital, we don't have to spend anything to keep the capital going because we don't have any. But the more capital we have, the more we have to spend just to keep that capital going. So now we're going to add that line to this picture. If we add that line to that picture, we're going to get something like this. So that's our depreciation investment line. Now we have two lines that intersect, or two curves that intersect. And we know in economics there tends to be something special about that intersection. So let's think about that intersection and the level of capital that we have at that intersection. Suppose the level of capital in the economy was below that. Suppose it was somewhere here. Well, in that case, the amount that we would have to spend to keep that level of capital going is less than the amount we're actually investing. So we're investing more than we need to in order to just keep the capital constant, which means capital is going to increase. So if we are below this intersection point, capital is going to increase because we're investing more than we need to to just keep it constant. But now suppose that capital was over here. Now we're investing less than what we would need to in order to keep the capital stock at its current level. If we're investing less than what we need to to keep the capital stock at its current level, that means capital is going to depreciate. Capital is going to decrease. That means that in the steady state, as we call it, the amount of capital that is going to be in this economy, we're going to put a star on this for the steady state level of capital, will be at that intersection. When we're at that intersection, we're investing exactly what we need to to keep the capital at its current level. At that level of capital, we can then go up to the Y line to read off how much GDP we're actually going to have. So once we've determined how much capital there will be in the steady state, we can determine how much output or GDP there's going to be at that steady state. So now we have a model that tells us if labor, natural resources, and technology are held fixed, what the level of capital will be in the economy and that determines what the level of GDP will be in the economy. So at this point, we have a model that tells us the level of GDP 
but not the growth of GDP. If nothing changes, we're simply going to remain at that level of capital and that level of GDP. So something is going to have to change in order for economic growth to happen. But this builds the foundation for what we call the Solo Growth Model. It's named after Robert Solo, a professor at MIT who won a Nobel Prize for this work in 1987. And as we said, it builds the foundation for much of our thinking about economic growth.